everyone, and welcome to the Family Treehouse, a podcast series brought to you by Storied, where I chat with people that have a passion for genealogy, storytelling, or both. I am your host, Heather Honert, and I am so excited today to have a guest all the way from the UK. Our guest is Natalie Pithers, and she is from Genealogy Stories, based, um, again, out of the UK. And I can't say enough good things about this woman. When I found her um, Facebook page and then her website over a year ago, she is just an amazing force in our field. So welcome, Natalie. Oh, thank you. I hope I live up to expectations. What an introduction. (laughs) We're just excited to have you here today. Super excited. So Natalie, let's start by, why don't you tell us how you kind of got your start in and family history and storytelling in general. Okay, well, well, family history goes back quite a way. So I started tracing my family history um, around about 20 years ago when I was 18. Um, So I was really lucky. My mum had delved into our family history a little bit, but way before the days of the internet. So she'd she'd kind of dabbled and got stuck and um, couldn't get hold of things and that that kind of problem. Um, So she had done a little bit. And also my great grandma, in fact, three of my great grandparents didn't die until I was about 11. So I knew three of them, which is really, really lucky. Um, And one in in particular, my my mum's nan, she used to tell these amazing stories. Um, So but they were they were just really cryptic. So she'd say things like, oh, um, you know, so and so died whilst falling off of the runner board of a car whilst escorting a lady to water. And they were all they were always like full of these little nuggets. <laughs> so I had like those kind of snippets of stories and this blue folder that my mum had um with, with um some family history details. And uh when I was about 18, the the I think it was the 1901 census came online and uh, and that was it. Mum and I brought a book and we just did it together. So that was Aww. that was kind of my first foray. And then um I went off to university and studied English literature and really quickly became mostly fascinated with 19th century literature. And I think the two just kind of went hand in hand, really. Um, Yeah. And it's been a lifelong obsession ever since. (laughs) (laughs) I I understand that totally. I used to teach high school English and English literature was my favorite. I know my kids always would give me a hard time, but loved it. (laughs) I get that. So why do you think storytelling is such an important part of the family history why do you think that component is needed I think storytelling is what makes us human it's what connects us as human beings I mean when somebody when when you've been through something sad or or even something happy like I don't know say you were bereaved you don't go to somebody and tell them statistics you You don't go actually my husband died at five o'clock on such and such date and we buried him here you you don't tell it like that do you 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 say like this awful thing has happened to me and I feel this and and you you naturally tell a story um so I think it's it's um it's therefore kind of logical that how we connect with the past and how we connect to people um, in the past would, would follow the same logic in that it, it has to be told in the format of a story. Because if you just sit there and list facts, you, you've lost people. And people don't live their life as a list of facts, do they? Right. All com- complex individuals. And storytelling allows for that complexity, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. That was a great analogy. I love that. Thank you. How, how do you go about writing a story when when you've got in your head a certain you know ancestor that you want to tell a story about what what kind of process do you go through oh gosh well everybody's different and I don't think there's one process that fits everybody no. I think everybody some people just want to dive straight in there I'm a bit like that I like just kind of dive dive in there and just start writing and then I kind of play around and put it in order some people it works to really plot it out but what I would say is really consider your audience because I think that 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 drives a lot of it so and when I say that I don't just mean who's reading it but what you want them to think and feel so what the message is of the story that you're you're writing so when you come to tell somebody about your ancestors if they could only go away with one thing or knowing or understanding one thing what would that be because if you put that at the heart of your story everything else just kind of that's like the backbone and everything else is kind of just around it Do you, uh, this wasn't one of the questions, but just kind of thinking out loud based on what you said, do you, do you feel like when you write stories, do you write shorter stories about ancestors or longer? Because that seems to be a story. One thing that people really get kind of stuck on, they feel like they need to write, you know, gigantic novels and, and how do your stories lengthwise look? Yeah, I, I, it probably varies, but all, all basically blog lengths. So um, so I've got some stories that I've ended up splitting up into three or four blog posts and they kind of feed on from each other. So they're longer, yeah. but certainly nothing novel length. I, I actually, I think 
writing a book book is a fantastic goal if that's what works for you um so i'm not knocking it but i actually think there's a real joy in writing shorter form blog posts partly because it's fantastic cousin bait so you set something but but also because as family historians we're always learning we're always like reading a bit more about the history of the time in which our ancestors lived or finding that extra genealogy document and when you do it in a kind of shorter blog format it allows you to go in and um, and add those details as you find them so you're not being held back by your own research desire and then never writing anything <laughs> right well and I think that happens so often I hear so many people say that you know that's kind of their lofty goal is to write that biography or you know of, a, of an ancestor and they just can't ever get started because it's such a you know such a daunting task to write that yeah much. I think I think it's too big I think um if you've never written anything that length before just just start out with short articles because you could always collate them and make them into a longer um a longer form book or into one story yeah absolutely um do you have recommend any uh, resources or tools for somebody that's just kind of starting to get into researching and writing their their family stories is there anything out there that you really kind of gravitate towards um well I don't know about resources or tools so much, but one thing that I would say is I think it's been completely invaluable to me when I come to write up my family history is using newspapers. Okay. So uh, using newspaper articles to find out what the weather was like and what people were gossiping about and where the local pub was and all those kind of little little nuggets. So really diving deep into newspapers um, and depending on where you are, that can be done in different ways. But there's there's lots of fantastic resources that have, um, you know, like Google Books and the Internet Archive that have old historic texts. So even if you can't access newspapers, there might be an alternative by looking at um, historic out of print, um, free copyright type books. Whenever I get in, newspapers are my favorite. And that has definitely been a common theme with um, our guests that newspapers are, are good. But I find that I just get down that rabbit hole of those newspapers and just I'm lost for hours. <laughs> oh, I have a whole article on how to set rabbit hole, what I call rabbit hole tethers. So they're like, so they kind of like allow you to go down that rabbit hole, but with a couple of things like uh, really small things like making sure that when you close your browser, everything's bookmarked, um, using a, a, a um, like a note taking tool like Notion so you can kind of clip and dump things in so that, yeah, I kind of believe in, I, I fall down a lot of rabbit holes, but I do, I've tried to set myself more tethers because I also get quite frustrated if I spend all of my time in rabbit holes and then at the end of the week go, oh, I've forgotten to write anything down. <laughs> I am definitely making a note of that. I'm going to I'll get that blog post and I'll, uh, I'll link it to our, um, to our, our video. Here. That's oh, lovely. <laughs> rabbit hole tethers. I'm going to use that now. <laughs> um, next question. This one's kind of a interesting question that people feel strongly about, um, usually in one way. How do you balance the importance of accuracy in your story um, versus kind of telling that compelling story? How do you try to marry those two? Yeah, that, that's really difficult. And again, I think everybody's everybody's different. And there is, I, I would say, a lot of people um, trying to be extremely factual really, really holds them back. Um, and, and actually, I would say it's your family history. You can do whatever you like with it. If you want to choose it into a choose your own adventure story or a comic, you can. It's yours. Um, but I, I think you just kind of... If you apply some 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 reasoning, so for example, if I was to write um, a story about a maid, I don't know exactly what her chores would have been. I don't know um, exactly what the house that she was in might have looked at, but I do know what scrubbing a floor feels like. I mean, I can actually physically get down on my knees and scrub a floor if I don't, um, and I can kind of add that kind of sensory information in to to make it come to life and feel more realistic without um, infringing on the fact. And I'd also say that historians wouldn't say that they did, in fact, historians generally speaking will say we are interpreting the evidence that we have and it is okay for genealogists and family historians to do the same I think we can we can really get kind of a bit of imposter syndrome around that and I, yeah. I think um yeah we, we shouldn't we should we should be brave <laughs> yeah good, the, good advice that was great advice love that um can you this is always my favorite can you share a um, a memorable family story or your favorite family story that you have and I oh, feel like that changes yeah. all the time, don't you? <laughs> no, that that yeah, it, that's that's really difficult. I mean, um, I think um, 
one of my favorite stories is on my pither side is that I discovered that um I can't remember how many greats it is off the top of my head but like say my, my third great times grandfather um was a military man and he'd um he, he'd progressed up the military he'd actually got um started off as a private from quite a poor background and worked his way up to sergeant which which you know was pretty good going um and he'd, he'd got that promotion partly by um detaining and uh, catching a um a deserter um so i often wonder how he would have felt when his daughter <laughs> <laughs> eloped with a man who had who, who was also a military man and had quite a nice military career but apparently uh, absconded and deserted the army in order to marry this man's daughter and I quite and they went on to have like 15 children together in, in a very very poor part of London so I'm sure life was a struggle but her brother lived nearby so they were she was obviously still in touch with her family and I quite often think yeah I wonder how that went down at the dinner table <laughs> you know, Eliza's gone and you'll never guess who she's gone with <laughs> Right. So that's one of my favorites. Oh, well, it makes me think, I kind of mentioned when we started how I found you. Tell us a little bit about your your Reclaim Jane challenge. Jane. I, just, I love yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, so Jane is probably one of my favorite ancestors um, of all time, really. And yet I know extremely little about her. So I was always told when I was young that um, from, on my dad's side that that we had uh, royal blood in us somehow, like the the, the, the king of France had um, had had a baby with a maid and, and we were like descended from this illegitimate child. And when I looked into my family history, I found that there was an illegitimate baby and he had this really unusual surname that he was using as a middle name to Crespinet. And then I did some more digging and I found Jane Lovegrove, um, 16, alone, uh, a maid in the household of a man who was a, a, a reverend. He was later defrocked, um, who was about 50. And she was like his only servant living there. And his name was Heaton de Crespinet. And so, you know, I can never absolutely prove that he's the father of this illegitimate baby. But the fact that she gave him um, both a first name and a surname that belonged to um, this particular family line. And what I find fascinating about that story is despite Jane having like no voice whatsoever, so she couldn't vote. Uh, if she left service without a reference, she never would have got another job again. That would have meant the workhouse. So despite all these limited options and and and, and her parents raised the babies, actually, she disappears from record. So I literally have her in the 1841 census and her baptism and that's it. So despite that real scant information, what fascinates me is this was obviously so important to the family because not only does he does her baby have this name, but it passes down several generations. And every cousin that I've ever contacted, and there have been lots from this Lovegrove line, all know the story for different versions of exactly the same story. So it has passed down um, 1840s to 2000 and 23 um, wow. across multiple lines yeah and and some of my cousins have really different interpretations they see it as kind of a love story I see it as an imbalance of power and that and that and that's fine but we've all most of us have heard in some form or the other that this really important person or a French aristocrat or you know something along those lines or in my case the king of France um <laughs> you know got someone pretty pregnant so I find that really fascinating uh, yeah. that she was so voiceless in her time and yet her stories carried on even if it's just a fragment that that's incredible to me that there you know mm. that many people and have told that story in different ways that's amazing that it's gone on for that long uh, yeah I, I think so yeah it, it's incredible I love that challenge that you created so I definitely encourage our listeners to check that out um because it's it's really cool I we all have I think those ancestors one you know female buried in there that we just you know don't know much about and, and yeah kind of yeah I kind of think those those ancestors I mean you quite often find ancestors where all you'll find of them I, ha I have one of the mem my members of my Curious Descendants Club uh she found an ancestor and all she found was um she didn't even find their name it literally it's just got wife of Swinton buried in such and such place and she's written a whole blog article about this person by just by looking at the history of the time that they lived in so some of it is kind of I wish I knew this and then it kind of yes. uses it as a way of exploring history but I love that because it's they're not lost then are they they're, right. they're in some small way remembered which feels so important yeah I I love that you said that they're not lost I, that's what's important to me you know when I tell those stories of of people that you know their voice is still heard even yeah you know, years later so. 
Yeah, I think we've got like a real innate drive to there's something really human about wanting to be remembered I was I was walking down the beach the other day and there were rock cliffs and people had been carving their names in it and there was one from like 1948 and then there was some like you know Lucy Love Stephen in the, in the rock kind of thing from 2013 I thought what is it about humans that we want to put something etch something on somewhere so if we yeah. can give that to somebody in the past how wonderful yeah yeah that's great um kind of to wrap up here what and any trip tips or tricks or pieces of advice or wisdom you have that you would like to leave with our, our audience today? Yeah, just right. It really doesn't matter if it's rubbish. It doesn't matter if you delete most of it afterwards, just, just make a start. And one of the ways that you could do that is um, think of a fact like your ancestor being um, baptized and then think about um, some of the sensory information that would go around that so like how cold was the water what was inside the church like what does it feel like to sit on a pew and use that as your starting base to just at least add a bit more sensory information around those um, facts because that in itself will bring it to life a little bit more even if that's all you do yeah definitely great well Natalie thank you for your expertise and your passion I am I'm honored that you spent time with me today oh no thank you <laughs> Until next time, friends, embrace the power of your family's untold tales and embark on a journey of discovery. Let the ink flow and the words dance as you weave together the threads of your ancestors' lives. Start writing your family stories today and let their voices echo through the generations to come at story.com. And that brings us to the end of this episode of The Family Treehouse, where we celebrate the power of storytelling and preserving our family legacies. Storied is more than just a platform for sharing stories. Dive into those historical records and newspapers, discovering the hidden gems that bring your ancestors to life. Add branches to your family tree, connecting the dots between generations. Thank you for joining us on this storytelling journey. Your stories matter, and through story, they have the power to resonate across time and touch the hearts of generations to come. Keep uncovering your family's history and keep the spirit of storytelling alive with Storied.